Now, in this special episode today, I'd like to introduce you to Simon Rinney. Now, he started Mindful Men in 2021, and this is really to share his own story of mental illness, which he's lived with, with over, for over 30 years, but also to help normalise the discussion about mental health. Now, Simon's aim is to encourage boys and men to open up, to get vulnerable, and to deal with the issues that are troubling them. And Simon's therapeutic approach is informed by his own lived experience, as well as the life of a father, as a husband, and as an everyday bloke. And Simon is a qualified social worker with 15 years experience in the Australian Public Service. And this includes areas such as the Department of Home Affairs, the Australian Border Force, and recently the National Disability, Disability Insurance Agency, and he held the position there as a senior planner. So I can't wait to introduce you to Simon today. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Somatic Movement and Mindset podcast with me, clinical somatic educator and founder of Total Somatics, Heidi Hadley. The Somatic Movement and Mindset podcast has been designed to help you gain a deeper understanding to how your mind and body work. You will learn about your amazing mind and body and why over time you can feel pain, recurring injuries and poor posture. Within this podcast, I will teach you why this doesn't have to be your future or the norm for you. Would you like to learn how to reduce pain, move freely and gain a new lease of life? Let's get started. So welcome back to this very special episode. And as you would have heard at the very beginning here, I'm going to introduce you to Simon. Now, Simon has got a very important message that I feel is so important. That's why I wanted him to come on to Somatic Movement and Mindset today. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Simon to you. And Simon, could you let us know a little bit more? We, we could see the bio there, but really what drove you into this area? And obviously there's a real passion there to get that message out. That would be wonderful. Yeah, thanks, uh, Heidi, for letting me come on the show for the first um, in the first place. Yeah, it's really good to to be here and and speak with your audience as well. And and as you mentioned, mental mental health is is something that I'm really passionate about, and it's because I've lived with it since I was eight years old, essentially. Um, but for twenty of those years, it was all bottled up, like most you know men across the world, and particularly Australian men. You know, I grew up in, in the same town that you live in, in the northern suburbs, and, and what it meant to be a man or a boy in the 80s and 90s was someone who bottled things up and didn't show emotions and had to suck it up and all that type of stuff. And, and what I learned over the years is that we didn't actually need to do that. We could talk about things, but it took me 20 years to figure that out. And so for the last 10 years, I've been on a journey of, of recovery and, and mindfulness and and therapy and medication and and just talking about what's going on in the inside with the hope that it inspires other guys to do the same as well because you know I know how hard it was to to not talk about it or have anybody to talk to about it um, and so that's why I'm really passionate about doing what I do um, and now I'm fortunate enough to have left the public service which I did some really cool things as you mentioned and um, but I'm really excited to have Mindful Men as a therapy business now that's dedicated to men's mental health, but also disability. And even though I talk about men's mental health, um, I think a lot of the discussion that we'll have today can cross over to women as well. So, um, you know, because it's not exclusive to men that what we're dealing with. And I know a lot of women who follow my work in Mindful Men, uh, in the Mindful Men community, experience very similar stuff to men as well. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to sharing my journey with you today. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And and it's so important, Simon. And I think this is a really good time to be living because as you say, 80s and 90s, it was like suck it up and just get on with it. And there's got to be something wrong with you. But we're realizing now, the more we learn about mental well-being, nobody's um nobody's uh, uh, like superhuman, really, are they? So um, and it it does cover all areas. And can I just share there was something that's on your website and you put here, which is why I thought it just resonates with what you said, is that your your it says Mindful Men provides a safe space for men, boys and their support networks to open up about what is troubling them. And that's the thing is sometimes it can be the support network that kind of drives or encourages that person to come forward because they might be minimizing their situation, for instance. Yeah, definitely. And, and for me, that was my now wife. Um, you know, I spent a long time trying to to sort it out myself, try to outthink it essentially. So when I say it, it's it's obsessive compulsive disorder, it's depression, it's anxiety. And 
you know, for a long time, I used alcohol to, to, to numb the pain and numb the, the thoughts that would race through my mind and, and, and decrease the anxiety and even also put a social hat on because I became quite introverted and, and shy and, and, and socially anxious. And so my now wife, as my support network, recognised that I wasn't showing up the way that she knew that I wanted to be. She recognised I was drinking too much. She recognised I was really depressed at the particular time 10 years ago. Uh, my OCD was through the roof. My anxiety was through the roof. I was just miserable as a person. And so as my support network, she, she said, you know, she planted the seed into me that, you know, it's okay to go get help, go get help and we'll work through it together. And, and, and Rachel, my wife, she's, she's the first, I guess, relationship where I felt safe enough to do that as well. You know, I've been through other relationships um, where I felt like I couldn't really be the person that I wanted to be. And I always felt like I was getting stuffed into other people's boxes about what their ideal life was and, and stuff like that. And mind you, like I was probably showing up as a bit of a, a douche. <laughs> um, you know, it was undiagnosed, you know, mental illness. So my behavior and, and the, my beliefs and my thoughts probably reflected how I was showing up in those relationships. But I still felt like it was always my fault when something happened, when something went wrong. And, and so Rach was probably the opposite to that. She's the first person who just accepted whatever was going on in my mind as being okay. And, and, and then, yeah, she really encouraged me to go get help. And, and I say supports in there as well, because, you know, you know, there's, there's, there's partners, there's kids, there's parents who all, you know, wrap themselves around various people who experience mental illness or disability, or even just stresses and, and, and other life in, impacts as well. And it's through those support networks that we can find strength and resilience and get the help that we need. So they're very important as part of the process. And how have you found, because you, you really started Mindful Men, didn't you, in 2021, and you've really benefited from that social, you know, that, that support network and how your wife has really supported you there. But since starting Mindful Men in 2021, and really, although it started then, you've got all that, those years of experience before. Um, how has things such as the pandemic really shifted things has that brought people more forward to speak to you has it shown up more because of course all of us I always say have been the best case studies with the pandemic it's it's really put a light on a lot of our things that we need to kind of address really yeah the pandemic um was essentially the birth of mindful men so so leading up until 2020 so I'd been with the NDIA so the National Disability Insurance Agency for two years prior to that high KPI environment it it's mm -hmm. As much as it tries to be an agency that really puts people first, there's just so many people in the system and so few people to do the work that people do become numbers and they be become KPIs, which internally didn't sit right with me. And, and I, I'm never a outputs person, I'm, I'm an outcomes person. And so for the two years prior to that, we went through a lot of transition in the workspace, a very high stressful work as well. Um, but also amazing work. I've met so many amazing people living with disability and their support networks, doing some incredible things in the world, you know, often in the face of great adversity as well. Um, so I was going through that the two years prior, but also the, the public service career for longer than that. I felt like I was stuck in the mud. I felt like there was no way to climb the ladder. I felt like, is this really what I want to do? Because like when I finished, when I went into the public service, it wasn't my dream career. It was just something that I, I landed in because I finished my social science degree you know, back in Adelaide. And I'm like, what do I do now? What does a social scientist do? And the only job that came up was public service work. And so I felt for a long time, like it didn't really light me up, even though I did some exciting things and, and stuff like that. But during the pandemic, what happened was, I had that stressful work environment, I guess the long-term impacts of the, of the work, of the industry that I didn't want to be in anymore, 30 years of mental illness as well. And then I kind of hit, and, and during that period, like we, I was studying part-time, a master's of social work. So I was doing that on the weekends and the evenings. We had two kids, you know, so I've got two kids now, two and a half and five and a half, but we had two kids. So we had, you know, we went through two baby stages during the pandemic, during the pandemic, but then also the lockdowns as well that, you know, in Queensland, we had five to six months initially, and then we, we came out, then we went back in. And because the nature of my work, I couldn't really go into the office and I didn't want to go in the office because I like working from home, but <laughs> like I couldn't go into work office and we couldn't see clients because the disability sector was, is one of those vulnerable cohorts. 
that you know they put on a higher level of of restriction so even then i was in lockdown for probably longer than a lot of other people just because of the nature of my work and so all of that happening at once kind of just boiled, got to a point where i was just i hit a brick wall and i burnt out and so 2020 i burnt out and i had to spend four to five months recovering and, and a lot of that was sitting on the couch i couldn't go to work i could barely function like physically and mentally i couldn't think straight i was very cynical i just basically had enough of a lot of the different things and I, and and so through that process i discovered mindfulness through my through counseling process um but it also gave me like this you know, I recognize other people in the workplace were also going through similar to me, like burnout and, and the NDIA, like there's a lot of burnout happening in that particular agency and other, and other high KPI environments around the world. Um, and so what I wanted to do as part of my recovery, I, I felt the need to talk about burnout in the workplace. So I went back to work and part of my recovery process was to present my story to my team and, and my, and my site. And then, so I did that. And then I, you know, managed to get a few other of the the office locations in in my region to come on board to a zoom chat and i just i shared what burnout was and what it was like for me to to live with that and and from there i also go okay this is an opportunity to talk about my other mental illnesses as well because i never actually spoke about it in the workplace the only people i've spoken to about it was my wife rachel and my therapists and my doctor nobody else knew about it and and other people might have hinted at it but generally no one really knew about it. So I used that opportunity to educate other people on burnout, which other people approached me and said, Simon, I'm feeling the same. And, and I know other people have gone on stress leave because of burnout since then. Um, and even then I found out they had gone on before then as well that I didn't realise as well. But I used that opportunity to talk more broadly about mental illness and how it impacted me as a, as a guy particularly, um, but also as a, as a human being as well and from that i got a lot of encouragement like oh this is a refreshing story to hear because everyone bottles it up and doesn't talk about this stuff particularly men and so then i started the instagram account so the mindful men instagram page which is now a facebook and now a linkedin now it's, i just started tiktok recently sharing these journeys these stories around mental illness not from just myself but people around the world and it's it's amazing how we could be separated by vast oceans but be experiencing very similar things at the same time and so it's grown into the mindful men podcast as well so that started this year and then then end of last year i finished the degree the, the masters of social work and then august this year we started mindful men as a therapy practice as well so now i'm taking those skill sets from what i learned at social work studies but also the last 30 years of of ocd depression anxiety and burnout and now I apply that in, in a mindfulness-based practice dedicated to men and their supports um, because I just know how hard it is for guys to talk. So by, by exploring this with men, you know, I can just get them talking and maybe that might reduce suicide data, which, you know, indicates that men are 75% more likely to die by suicide. Maybe that can bring down family and domestic violence data because, again, 75% of men are the perpetrators of family and domestic violence. And what these two data sets tell me is that we really do struggle as men to open up about what's troubling us on the inside and when we do it often comes out as anger or, or um, aggression violence all this type of thing or self-harm and stuff like that when if we just went to counseling or if we just learn to to reflect and become mindful maybe we can curb some of that data and, and live a healthier happier life as men in the community and it's a really powerful thing that you're doing, Simon, because if you're bringing if you're bringing this whole therapeutic approach in, it's stopping it in that generational side mm -hmm. of things because there's often an intergenerational effect, or the, the, it's very it's a very instinctive response, isn't it, just to kind of um, be aggressive or angry or shout and that sort of thing, um, because maybe from uh, the lack of learning and, um, strategies and mechanisms growing up. So it's bringing those, I'm assuming that's what, would you do that sort of thing in sessions is that you bring in the different strategies so that they can rein that in because it's like once you've said that, it's changed the whole family dynamic, hasn't it? And it's really about reining that back in. Uh, and when, we, when we're when we more mindful, as you know, it, we're using more of that emotional intelligence rather than the, 
the sort of uh, limbic system, that stress reactive area of the brain. So what kind of things, you know, obviously you mentioned that, what kind of um, strategies would you approach? Because it's going to vary with individuals, but what kind of things do you uh, focus with? I think the, the first part is just getting guys talking and and in the door like this one guy that i'm trying to get in the door at the moment just because he's 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 a bit hesitant and and stuff and that's okay like it all happens within time but the first few sessions of of a of a therapy process with me is always around exploring why you're here in the first place and and a lot of that is going back to our childhood and and reflecting on how we grew up and the relationships like what was our our parents like or or another significant person was there a trigger point for or trigger points like was there multiple and like what how did they get through that so a lot of it's just an exploration of history because that really does i guess in that first six years we're talking about the the formative years of our lives it's, we, a lot of people talk about attachment theory so we're looking at that type of stuff as well and just just trying to work out how did they come to being however old they are today and what's their understanding of the world and their place within it. So that's always, a, and I, I use that as, I like to refer to that as a mindfulness-based approach anyway, because we're becoming mindful of who we are. That's, a, that's what I often say in the podcast. The podcasters are all around being mindful of who we are and how we can grow. So then the growing part is, is what are we going to use, do with this information that we have now about ourselves, this story about ourselves? How can we step on a pathway towards recovery? And so the mindfulness approach I do, I, I draw from is from acceptance and commitment therapy. So I really love this particular therapy because A, it helps us to, to navigate through stressful periods. So it's kind of like that whole sitting with anxiety, for example, you know, trying to get over the peak of anxiety and, and strategies around that. So that's really useful for someone like me, for example, with my OCD recovery as well. So a lot of that, it's around trying to prevent me from doing the cognitive, cognitive behavior or the cognitions no, not cognitions, the compulsion, sorry, the compulsive behavior around an obsessive thought, which alleviates the obsessive thought. So it's a lot of that sitting with using your five senses to ground ourselves in the moment as well. Um, and just de-stress it could be through breath work or breathing techniques as well. And then from there, the mindfulness-based approach for, for what I do and from acceptance and commitment therapy is around exploring our values. So what is it that makes us tick? What is it, you know, how are we showing up in the world now, but how do we want to show up tomorrow and the next day and the next day? And, and then using that, because a lot of guys and people in general, like we don't look at our values a lot. Uh, it's not something, unless we're doing like a leadership day at work or whatever, it's not something that you really tune into. But if you can do it at a personal level, and I've got a deck of cards that I go through, there's like 50, 50 cards with 50 different values or so. And we go through a series of process of elimination, essentially, and, and helping the guys come down to their six or so core values that that light them up that get them jumping out of bed and going you know love or family or respect these are the things that that matter to me and that when someone doesn't show me respect for example it triggers me because it's a clash against my value and so we look at that type of stuff and then how we can use that to live the life that they want to so setting goals for the future and mindfulness-based goals as well is like they've got these values maybe as a relationship issue that they're trying to deal with so how can they deal with that relationship issue based on their values maybe it need they need to explore more date nights maybe they need to explore different ways of communication maybe the relationship that they're in isn't the relationship for them and so they've got to cut that cut that tie and go on a pathway towards finding someone who does align with their values whatever it is and the guys will and the client not just guys but clients will discover this for themselves it's a, it's a self-discovery process i'm not going to tell them what to do in their lives i'm just going to guide them with these are the tools these are the tools that i've used because i've used them in my own therapy um and they really do work and and then adjusting things along the way because as you said each each person's different so what one person responds to well might not necessarily respond with another person so gratitude journaling is, is a great example you know, I've tried different techniques and I haven't really gelled with it, but then I found one technique that's really useful just by adjusting the way that I do the practice. But other people don't want to write down their gratitude, what they're grateful for, because they're like, and particularly guys, they might be like, that's a bit hippie or that's a bit girly or whatever. But, you know, some of them I can work through that and get them to do it, but others are like, yeah, I'm not doing that. And that's okay. It's different horses for courses, you know? And, and so... You know, I had one guy the other day who loves basketball and this is the disability space. So we went and played basketball for an hour 
And as we were playing, we were talking about some of the stresses in his life. And then we could start to, to, I guess, set goals or strategies in place on the basketball court while we're shooting, doing the thing that he loves, and also getting some vitamin D and exercise at the same time. So these are things, again, tuning into our, our five senses and doing some of these self-care things without even really knowing that we're doing it. as Because a lot of guys, they don't want to sit in a clinical room on a, on a couch and tell me they're all there deepest darkest secrets and all that type of stuff and that's okay like we'll work out a strategy that works for them so so yeah that's some of the that's some of the tools i use and it's a really cool process it's cool to see the guys grow in this space um but also i grow a lot as well so i learn a lot about different people and and cultures cultural you know clashes or just different ways that people see the world and their resi- different versions of resilience and strengths as well which then i can draw on and go okay Maybe I could use some of this as well. And, and that's why I find it's great value in talking about this stuff on podcasts and through the Michael Men podcast as well, because we can share all these things together and work out different strategies that we might have not really thought about before, but that can really work wonders for us. Mm, it's absolutely brilliant. And, and it was interesting. I was about to um, mention something when you finished, but you jumped in and said it, which was that <laughs> men don't always want to sit in a room. And especially if they've never met you before, they're like, who's this bloke? Why do I want to kind of tell him everything? You know, um, but it, it's like over here in Australia, they have, is it called the men's shed, don't they? So it's mm. like men just get together and they'll do different activities. And it's almost like a moving meditation, is it? Or a moving mindfulness. It's so yeah. when you're busy doing something, it's like, um, you probably know this as a parent, that if you want to sometimes find out a little bit more about what's worrying your child instead of sitting them down it might be that you just get them to do some coloring in or you might be in the kitchen cooking and you just naturally bring those questions out and they just open up don't they and so you can yeah. see that it, it's it's a very successful way to do it and um, I was thinking Simon you know and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this because I've seen it over the years here um, and online is that you know you can have people and they feel like they've got it together through their life you know, they might be really like a real cognitive type A personality. I've got everything in order. Everything's going really well, very successful, all sorts of things. But then a life event comes up like fatherhood, maybe middle age, maybe their partner's going through the menopause. So the dynamics change there. Uh, maybe it's a loss of identity because of redundancy or because of the pandemic. It brought things up. You know, yeah. So what is it like fatherhood? All, so, all sorts of things or um, injuries that just seem to be coming back much more than they used to be, which is now they're starting to feel that they're just not in control like they were before. Um, how, what, what kind of have you seen that in your practice and how do you manage that? Because that's really, really common, isn't it? That you think you've got it all in order and then you start realizing that actually, you know, and it could be a family, you know, a parent that's getting sick and it brings your own mortality. Um, how do you kind of approach that and what have you known through your experience with that? Yeah, I guess you're looking at that. That example is, is me. Like, and so with, so with OCD, for example, it, it and depression, anxiety, and even masculinity in, in growing up in the 80s and 90s as well. Like, like we grew up playing Aussie rules football, the northern suburbs of Adelaide, you know, very masculine thing to do. You know, Adelaide, the northern suburbs of Adelaide, very working class, manufacturing jobs. My mum was a cleaner. Like I had three brothers, dad, we played football and, and we watched football. We lived and breathed football. And so everything I learned about that <clears throat> and through the process of, of learning how to play football dad was very much like you know don't mess around at training don't mess around at games you will you know you're there to perform and and and, and we were pretty good at football me and my brothers were really good at football and so but we it was drilled into, into us early that we needed to almost i needed to be perfect i needed to be perfect on the footy field i needed to be perfect outside because also i was you know scared of getting in trouble was i didn't like i, liked, I hated getting in trouble by dad and and I knew I was in big trouble if dad was coming down the hallway or whatever. Um, and, and that coupled with the OCD fueled this high level of perfectionism in me that everything had to be perfect because when things weren't perfect, my OCD would be through the roof. And, and then as I got older, my depression was through the roof, my anxiety and my stress and everything else. And so I set a huge bar for myself of perfectionism. And then throughout my career, I learned, I apply that to my career, my 15 years in the public service is I set the bar really high for myself to the point where I was hitting that bar for, for probably 12 of the years. But then the last three, particularly when the burnout happened 
burnout made me realize is that I could no longer jump up and touch that bar anymore. Um, I was struggling to get off the ground. I was, and I couldn't figure out why. And it was, it was just a combination of all those things you mentioned before of getting me down and, and they would just, and the thing with burnout is it takes a long time to get to that burnt out stage as well. So it was prolonged stress and, and the stress that I had been ignoring and trying to deal with through alcohol or the occasional exercise just wasn't working and as well as it should have been. And even the medications I was on weren't working the way that they should have been. I needed to be back in therapy to talk about some stuff as well. And, and, and so, yeah, like that, for me, that was that life event. And, and it was a recognition of everything that I was doing, like working in a job that didn't fulfill me and trying to study and, and having these goals for, for the, the business that I've got now. And, and then trying to make that transition from, from a nine to five to, to the business and, and lose all that financial security and, 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 and and time security and everything, all that, you know, job security, because now I've got to find my own clients and I'm like, how am I going to do that and all that type of stuff. And, and so, <clears throat> yeah, burnout really showed me that perfectionism that I was fueling and this bar that I was putting up for myself was just unattainable. And so as part of my, fr my practice framework, I've really been embracing this, this concept around wabi-sabi and it's the beauty and imperfection. And it's, it's recognizing that we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I shouldn't expect other people to be perfect, including my son, because we often clash and he's five, but we often clash because I need to do things my way. He needs to do things his way. So I'm, as a dad, I'm recognizing, you know, I've got to just pull back and let him discover the world in his way. Um, don't be such a helicopter parent or, or try to stop trying to be a perfect parent because really perfectionism doesn't work. And when we, we put these high bars of, of, of perfectionism or, or standards above us and other people, we often find ourselves angry and stressed because we, we stop hitting those, those markers. And then like, but we can often get much more value from, from just throwing the bar on the ground and just going, going through life in a more genuine and authentic way. Um, and so that's something I've personally been going through and, and how COVID really impacted me, but it's similar with other guys that I work with, you know, some of them are, relationship breakdowns so they're trying to navigate themselves through that i had one client who you know we did a lot of identity work he talked about identity and we've, we rediscovered his identity through a relationship breakdown through his values and reconnecting him with his values that helped him reconnect with his true identity and the identity that he wanted to be as a father but also as a as a partner and so forth and and then that helped him to recover much more quickly and get to a much more stable place than, it, than just traditional talking about things. So when we do therapy with a purpose and a mindfulness-based purpose, we can certainly work through things faster. And he was really committed to the cause. Like, I guess that's another point. You've got to be committed to it. Like getting pushed into therapy or pushed into a mental health recovery process isn't necessarily going to, to yield you the results that people expect because you're just going to fight back against it. You're going to be like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm here because somebody else wants me to be here. But for me, the guys that come through that want to be there and they want to explore different purposes and modalities, they're the ones that get the best results. And for me, that it comes back to that Tony Robbins quote that I always love. It's like change happens happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. And that's like for me a self-reflective moment going, yep, whatever I'm doing now is not working. I've got to change or do something differently so that I can be the person I've always wanted to be, not the person I've just happened to be at the moment. That's brilliant. And I wanted to ask Simon, because um, I know when we've chatted before, I've said how me, I've personally been impacted with men's mental health. So some very close people to me suffering with different types of mental health over the years. And, you know, there's been a few um, suicides as well. So mm -hmm. this, this is why I wanted us to really bring this out. Now, it's a very complex situation, suicide, and, and anyone listening to this, you know, we both would support, encourage people to get that mm. support. But part of the reason that I know in one situation is that that person was of a certain age group where they felt that they had everything in order, but they didn't, or they felt it was a weakness to go and get that support and that help. Um, so what kind of advice would you give if somebody's at that point that they just think it's there's nothing worth there's not, that's not really anything worth living for, but, you know, because it's a, so important to get that, that message about to, to support people at this point. I think it's, it's around, it's, 
it's not weak to speak. And particularly for guys like, you know, 80s and 90s, I grew up northern suburbs of Adelaide. I keep saying this because it's really important to highlight that it was a, a period of time when the people around me was how I understood about what masculinity is and what it meant to be a boy and then become a man as well. It's like the suck it up kind of mode. You know, our heroes that we aspired to was, you know, the Terminator, Die Hard, Rambo, like really masculine, hyper macho men. But they're just social constructs of what it means to be a guy. In reality, what it means to be a guy is someone who is strong in, in different areas, but also someone who can tap into vulnerability. And because and, that also is strength when we can tune into that because we can go, okay, I'm, I'm hurting here. Why am I hurting? How can I grow? And so if, for someone who thinks that they've had it all in order and then something's happened um, that's really just throwing them off the deep end and they're struggling, just recognize that go, just because you're a bloke doesn't mean you can't talk about these things and open up about these things. And it's actually a healthy thing to do. And the, and what, some of the things that come up for me in, in recent times, at the start of this year, I was getting a lot of intrusive thoughts around harming myself, like, like suicidal ideation. And it's not that I wanted to do it. It's not that I want, didn't want to be here. It's just that these are thoughts that were coming into my mind and were causing me distress. And so... I was really reluctant to go and see the doctor about it because I was worried that he would take my kids away. He would call child safety or child protection, take my kids away because they might say Simon's a danger. But in reality, what happened was, is I, I did go to the doctor and I said, look, these are the thoughts that I'm having. And, and he just said, Simon, they're just thoughts. They're just intrusive thoughts. And, by, and so by sharing them, it does two things. One, it helps take the burden off my shoulders. and and so then the world doesn't feel like it's weighing me down. I've, I've put it out to the world. You know, I'm now getting help. I'm with a professional. Usually it's good to do it with a doctor, particularly if you're feeling about suicide, do it with a doctor or counsellor or therapist. We've got amazing resources like free hotlines you can do. And I've got one here next to me is men's line. So one 9978 That's one that's similar to Lifeline that we've all heard about, but it's dedicated to men. But then you've got Lifeline, 131114. And this sits next to my, my desk all the time. So when I'm talking about this type of stuff. And the second thing it does is, is it disempowers the thoughts as well. So often, and I often laugh about this in the OCD space with my own OCD is like the very first OCD thing that came into my mind was when I was eight, some student said in the schoolyard, Simon, if you stop talking for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. And so that created the OCD. And, and for me to alleviate that obsessive thought, I performed a compulsive act, which was humming to myself. Now, when I, when I was going through this for two years as an eight-year-old, it was like, this is life and death stuff. I do not want to lose my voice. I will hum and hum and hum because I was always checking that my voice was there. But now when I say it as a 39-year-old, I actually say it and I'm like, Simon, that's really stupid. <laughs> like... But like, and, and when you can say it and, and I, I laugh at it because it's part of my coping strategies. I, I laugh at it because I think mental health is something that can be funny when, when we're in a right space of mind to reflect on it. And so I'm laughing at it. It might not be funny for another person. So I do recognize that. But when I say it, I feel it really disempowers these thoughts and beliefs that I had. And I'm like, yeah, that is a really silly thing to have done. Cause like, I didn't realize at the time that monks go for years without talking. You know, <laughs> if I knew that at eight, I'm like, maybe I wouldn't have, maybe I wouldn't have done that for two years. Maybe I would never have developed OCD. I don't know. But even like now as a 39 year old, when I'm doing my safety checking, I'd still do it. Like even last night I was doing it. Um, even this morning I was doing it. And when I say it out loud, it does sound really silly. And it, it just, that's part of the disempowering process. And so by talking about it and, and recognizing that it's not weak to speak, you can disempower all the thoughts from your mind. You don't have to try to outthink them, but when you outthink them, it just gets faster and faster and faster. And in, and in a lot of cases, you lose track of reality as well. So I've, often out, I've often thought about things so much that it becomes distorted reality. So I, like, for example, a Christmas party where I've gone and I think I've drink and, drunk too much and made a fool of myself, I would then spend four days or three days thinking about that party over and over again, trying to check or make sure that I didn't say something wrong or do something silly to the point where I've even forgotten what even happened at the party. And this is, this is the power of the mind. It will, it will 
keep us locked in there. But by talking about it with a doctor, even just with a friend or, or a partner who's got a good head on their shoulders, just talking about it or writing it down on a piece of paper and never showing it to anyone, just writing it down and then scrunching it up, burning it, ripping it up, whatever, just gets the thoughts out of your head. And then things become a bit easier to understand, a bit clearer. And you can just see it for what it is. It's just words that often don't mean anything. And doesn't mean you're weak for thinking them. Doesn't mean you're really mentally unwell for thinking them. Sometimes, yes, you might be really mentally unwell and need professional help. And that's when you call the crisis hotlines or triple zero in Australia. Um, but often it's just, we put the burden on ourselves to be perfect, but we don't need to do it alone. We can go through it. We can get therapists who understand us. If you come to me, I'm going to know about OCD, depression, anxiety, and burnout because I've lived with it. There are other therapists who've done the same. They've lived through it. They might know PTSD or schizophrenia. They might know autism, disability, intellectual disabilities, acquired brain injuries, whatever it is. Like there are people out there who have got the study behind them, but also the lived experience as well. And, and just, it just takes a phone call often, you know, mm. and you don't have to do it alone. Yeah, and it's really interesting you mentioned about the overanalyzing and overthinking mm. and that rumination because that is a trauma trait, isn't it? Really, that 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 um, can happen. And and I've mentioned in podcasts before, Simon, how uh, because of our mindset of, of, of what we've taken in over the years and our experience and things, it does change our perception of a situation. And when a, when people have been and gone from that situation and they're carrying on with their life we're then over analyzing the whole thing and I, and you mentioned tony robbins i think tony robbins once mentioned an expression of how you know when you when you keep thinking of something and you're over and you're reliving something that could be decades ago mm. you know you're the only person you're injuring is yourself but what happens is is the more you ruminate and you think about it it becomes more embellished and it's far from the original situation um, and often that situation will never occur because it's just been fabricated in your head as a sense. So it's not minimizing what's been happening, but it's when people notice they're starting to go into that overanalyzing or ruminating or again, re recalling an, uh, an event that hurt them even years ago. It's like, just stop it there if you can stop it, because it's literally like you're just beating yourself up again and it, and it affects really into your self-worth, doesn't it? Yeah, I I had a chat on my podcast with a guy called John Shearer and he's a mindfulness coach and mindfulness master and he loves acceptance and commitment therapy too. And, and he said this great line, which was, which I thought was right on point is that when we constantly think about the past that can lead to depression and because it gets us down, it weighs us down with thinking, Oh, what, what, what were all the could have, should have, would have type moments. But likewise, when we constantly think about the future in the same way, we're overanalyzing what might happen. And I often do this myself, like because part of my social anxiety, even on my own podcast, which is something that I've created, having guests on and, and you know, like, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? Like, I might just start overanalyzing it. That creates anxiety. So you've got this depression anxiety scale that when we're constantly thinking backwards or thinking forwards, like we just get ourselves into worked up for often for no good reason at all. And so I love, so what I love about mindfulness is bring us back to that, that present moment where it's the only real moment that we can control in anything. It's like, so how are we showing up right now? What are we feeling right now? What can we do right now? As opposed to thinking about yesterday or thinking about tomorrow um, and just be present in the moment. And then that's when we can start to feel a bit more joy, a bit more happiness, a bit more safety, security, and and all those types of things and that also benefits the people around us as well because often like as a parent we might be thinking about oh you know am i going to have enough money to pay for that bill coming up or am i you know i feel bad about what i did with you know i yelled at my child yesterday and punished them for whatever reason as well but you know if we can be more mindful in the moment and present in the moment we can just be around the people that we love and show them our full attention as opposed to being disconnected mm -hmm. and thinking about all the other things in life that don't really matter aside from that that present you know current moment that we should be trying to to get into and i struggle with it i really do because i guess like my ocd mind takes me all over the place and 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 stuff like that but it's something that i work on every day and it's an everyday thing not just an every now and then thing um and there's different ways you can do it like you know exercise is a good one you know, becoming mindful in the moment with exercise. Like it could be going for a bike ride with your kids, 
you've got to be present on that moment because if you're not, the kids might ride in front of a car or something like that. And 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 so you really that they're, they're good ones that you can do where you can become more present in the moment. And then afterwards, you feel better as well, and you and you realize, oh, I've stopped thinking about tomorrow. I stopped thinking about yesterday. I just feel really good. So, um, yeah, there are strategies to address that as well. Mm. That's brilliant, Simon. And and as we started off with this, is it's been a lived experience, but then it's bringing all your other knowledge, skills, and techniques in as mm. well. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Now, as we come to kind of close up the podcast, is there anything that you want to kind of bring out that we haven't discussed? Any main points or um, takeaway points you want people to to finish with? Yeah, I think opening up about mental health is really challenging. It took me twenty years to go in there, and I remember like when I went and saw the doctor. I choked on the words, I think I've got mental health issues as they came out. So I know how hard it is, but there's things you can do before you even get to that stage that might actually stop you from having to go and have a mental health discussion. Or it might be something that you can fill your cup because we're in the mental health space, we're always talking about filling your cup, fill your cup up with good things so that you've got the energy to deal with all the other life stresses. And so there's four things that we can do before we do anything else. It's one, are you exercising? Have you been outside or inside or done some sort of exercise? And it could be gentle movement. It doesn't have to be going on a, like doing a boxing course. It could be just walking around the block. Two, are you sleeping right at the moment? Are you getting enough quality sleep? Like they used to say that you only need six or seven hours. I don't believe that. I'm more of a double digits guy. If I can get 10 hours, I would be a really good space the next day bit hard with kids but um yeah that's what i try to do so are you sleeping enough as well it's really important um are you eating well i said exercise yeah exercise sleep eating well are you eating enough you know variety of diet as well are you getting some vegetables fruit and all that type of stuff in as well less processed stuff um and i've forgotten the last <laughs> that's where my brain is today it's this is a mental health discussion isn't it so sometimes i so it's eating exercise oh drinking are you drinking too much are you drinking too much alcohol? And, and that for me has been something I've really struggled with is, is drinking too much alcohol as a coping mechanism as well. And in Australia, we've got a big drinking culture. So it's hard sometimes to be sober and because and, you get a lot of peer pressure around that. But I often find like, are you drinking way too many glasses of wine or are you sitting down on the couch and drinking a six pack by yourself to, to try and slow things down? And, and if you are, can you have a bit of a dry spill or cut back or, or whatever and just or replace it with water as well just just water can do you know our bodies are made up with or was it 90 percent of water or so are we filling our bodies with the good stuff essentially um so those four things you can look at right to today you can do that today and and do a bit of self-reflection going oh yeah i'm not really showing up in these spaces um i can do more exercise i can get some more sleep I can stop scrolling on my phone just before I go to bed, all those types of things. Um, and if that doesn't work, find someone who has good head on their shoulders. It could be a friend, family member, partner. Just have a, a mental health discussion. We, we talk about are you okay day here in Australia. I like to think every day is an are you okay day. Like just check in with the other person. But if you don't have that other person who you feel safe with and respected with, your GP is a good place to start because they've had millions of these discussions before and they know where to refer you to get extra help. So that's the process. That's the pathway. It sounds daunting um, and it is daunting, but once you do it, so many doors and windows open that you thought were jammed shut for a long time. Brilliant. And the thing is, Simon, if it's the big step of just taking that first step maybe at this point they're a bit apprehensive to see a doctor for whatever mm -hmm. different belief systems and thoughts that they have how could they reach out to you because really you you are providing this safe space for men and for boys and for that whole support network so if that is their first step um to to starting to bring awareness to their mental health where can they find you and i'll make sure we put all this in the show notes as well anyway yeah so i guess if you're not ready to talk about anything the the best place to go is is my social media stuff. So I, I I post about this stuff all the time and I've got the Mindful Men podcast where we're, I have discussions with people all over the world about various things from mental illness to disability to um, I've got one on that's coming out tomorrow around patriarchy as well. And, and, and you know, I've talked to doulas, social workers, psychologists, all sorts of people 
so that we can be mindful of how we sh- who we are and how we're showing up in every aspect of our life. It's not just about mental health because the mental impacts, the physical, the physical impacts, you know, the relationships and all the, all sorts of things like that. So they're good podcasts are a fantastic, whether it's my podcast or your podcast or somebody else's podcast, they're, they're free, they're easily accessible and they can give you good tips and, and just help encourage you to go, what's going on inside? I don't, I don't like this, you know, and get it out. But then if you do want to take the next step and work with me in Australia, so I, I, I only practice in Australia, the social work and therapy side. So you can just go to my website, it's www.mindful-men.com.au and you'll access my services there and it highlights the kind of work I do, why I do it, the very stuff that we've talked about. And then also my contact details as well. Um, but yeah, aside from that, just check out the socials, you know, like and, and, and share this episode with somebody that you know might be struggling um, and to just start a conversation today because it's okay to, to be not okay. And I love that point that you mentioned, Simon, about the podcast. They are very powerful. And I'm sure you get lots of messages. I get messages from people all around the world listening. Mm. And what's really nice is they can put those headphones on. Nobody knows what they're listening to because you never know if there's a bit of social pressure in the dynamics that they live, that people are going, you know, they might be belittling, going, what are you listening to that rubbish stuff for? You know, because they might be thinking, as you say, it's hippie-ish or, um, you know, some people have still got these belief systems that it's self-indulgent or navel gaze to talk about your wellness and your health um, and it's it's kind of like we just don't talk out our emotions we push it down because it is a weakness so that's the thing is they are brilliant these podcasts because they've got them in their head they've got them in their ears and they're just listening to them in a in a safe place um, as they start to heal because it all starts from within doesn't it when we start from there it has a ripple effect to the rest of our well-being Definitely. I'm glad you brought up the head, the headphones because I was on my podcast, I was talking to a, a coach to the tradies. So Aaron WD Huey, who talks about this very thing, he can be on a work site, very masculine thing. And in fact, young tradies have higher rates of suicide than the general population as well. And it's a very male um, industry to be in. But yeah, he said, it's a great thing. You can put your, your earphones on, do your day's work in a hyper-masculine environment, like a trades, you know, a work site. And be you know working on your mindfulness and, and your well being without anyone even noticing it, or you can do it on a walk. I often have my headphones on on a walk and listening to podcasts um, about all sorts of things just to to cheer me up or or give me insight into different things. It's a hugely valuable tool and it's free and it's accessible on whatever platform you're listening to. And I suppose, I mean, Simon, we could go on for ages. I'm sorry about this. We were supposed to close up, but we're still talking because we're so passionate about it. But I was thinking if you have got, say, a young trader that's listening, um, they can start to develop some little ways of building a conversation into somebody that they can almost see themselves in them. Um, and if they're then going, oh, you know, and they've gauged that they're not going to laugh at them or, you know, they've got these worries and they go, I think you might quite like this. And if anyone's listening and you're thinking of that other person that would benefit from like Simon's podcast or from what we're discussing here today, um, please share it because you just don't know how much. And I've gone all goosebumps because of it, Simon, because, as you know, I'm really passionate about this. You just don't know what is really going on in that person's life and how just that one episode could save their life or it could start that whole recovery to bring him back uh, a better well-being mentally physically energetically emotionally everything really absolutely 100 percent so I think now we will love and leave everyone that's watching because we will carry <laughs> but it's been an absolute wonderful opportunity to have you on here Simon and as I said all the details will be in the show notes please keep in touch with Simon um, through uh, his podcast and also through social media if you're here in within Australia you can also do telehealth and all sorts of things with Simon so keep in touch with him because he's a very very useful support network for if you're within Australia but globally as well so thank you so much again Simon so thank you everyone for listening today Um, All my love and best wishes to you and um, see you soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining me today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and also forward this on to somebody you know will benefit. To learn more about pain relief, plus how to improve your health and well-being, go to totalsomatics.com. Until next time, take care.